Well, in my collection of 25,000 toys, there are quite a few hundred optical devices. And in this range, there are just five I've come across, just five, which rely upon the stereoscopic facility in the brain. In particular, they require two good working eyes, a processor, wherever that is. And here I have a little difference of opinion with Terry Pope, who designed or devised or developed some of these. I think you have to have the right mental attitude and imaginative mind, even a gullible personality for some of them. I have all these in abundance. So the five, first of all, in gesture form, with my two eyes being the tips of my fingers, are thus, 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 and thus. A hyperscope, it increases your sense of stereoscopy, very remarkably. A monoscope, or synopter, they called it in 1905, when Zeiss produced them. I called it a cyclopter, it was like one eye in the middle of his forehead. This is not the same as closing one eye. You have both eyes open and your processor is working and you get a more interesting effect. The monoscope. The pseudoscope, probably the most bizarre and interesting of the lot, but sometimes the hardest to achieve any effects from it. This is not the same as squinting. Your eyes don't squint, but the paths to the eyes cross over. The earth scope, which is probably the rarest of the lot and the one you're least likely to see in your lifetime, which is a pity, it's a good effect and a time scope. One eye sees information ahead of the other eye, but it's able to perceive it. So, five scopes, and I'll probably only have time to cover the first two, which is a shame, but at the next one I'll probably do the other three. We live in an age of instant gratification, and when Terry does these talks, he does let people see the scopes, but I worked on the back of an envelope what it would cost me to do this, we need 300 sets of five scopes. We need an army of volunteers to show you how to use them. We need buses to take you to two locations in different parts of the city. And I get not much change out of half a million dollars and it'll probably a day, day to do it in, so no chance there. Instead, I must fall back on a very old-fashioned wish and hope that you enjoy the pleasure of anticipation. <laughs> Sometime in the next five or ten years you come across these fairly rare scopes and enjoy your moment of pleasure. And it is brief, because many, many friends who visit me in my backyard in, in, in London, and for many occasions when I've given a scope like this, a monoscope to my friends, the scenario is as follows. I will play act for five seconds. My guest, my visitor goes, oh, great man, I see the effect at once, yes, oh, that's a great one, thanks a lot. Next. So we can't do that, I'm afraid. So, five, uh, but I'll cover probably the first one or two. The hyperscope's got the most to say about it. The first thing is you get a very heightened stereoscopy. Things look very three-dimensional. If I put my hand here on my nose, it looks as though it's a long way in front of the nose. If I walk away from it very slowly, my body size gets smaller very quickly because you have a heightened sense of space. Walk back towards you and put my arm like that is it's quite extraordinary. The arm looks quite gothically long, very bizarre, very strange, but quite entertaining. Women can stick out their chests and more, look more buxom. And then two side effects from this one. One is that people's body sizes seem to be a little bit smaller. Now this is strange because there's no lensing here. It's, it's flat mirrors, it's flat prisms. Why is this? It's a lovely example of our self-centeredness. If you're looking at me with a hyperscope, your eyes are out on stalks, you can see further around my big A to my fat tum, and you say to yourself, I'm all right, Jack, Jill, it's that Tim Rowett, he's made himself a bit smaller. <laughs> with the, the second scope, it'll do the other way around. The other effect is more mysterious. When I first met Terry 40 years ago, he couldn't explain it. Well, recently he did explain it, but so obscurely I'm afraid I've forgotten it. The effect is that it's as if you're down here, about four foot high at, say, the age of 12, before your growth spurt. Why the horizon plane should be a bit closer to you, I really don't understand. Now, if you put your eyes more than eight inches apart, you run up against the 11% rule, discovered by a psychologist, which says that if the two images are more than 11% in difference, you get separation. You don't get the fusion working, and you just get what they call retinal rivalry. I can't roll my eyes. Here's retinal, right, retinal rivalry, retinal rivalry. My left eye is seeing you, and right eye is seeing this. Very strange, retinal rivalry. Uh, what have I got to do? If, you have look, if you're looking at things much further away, then you don't have this problem. 
And you look, for instance, in his early days, Terry Pope made a scope with his eyes 25 feet apart, took the awkward apparatus out into probably Salisbury Plain, and set it up with telescopes on the pieces, looked through and saw people about half a mile away at a car park. At that distance, even with telescopes, you can see people clearly, but the three-dimensional information is lost. However, with the eyes 25 feet apart, some measure of stereoscopy is restored. In a conversation with my guru, he mentioned that it's been a practice now for some 30 or 40 years to help reconnaissance aircraft improve their quality of what they're observing by putting little cameras in the wingtips. So your eyes are now 300 feet apart, 5,000 feet up in the air, a mile away, and some measure of stereoscopy can be restored for accurate observation. He speculates that it's possible you might be able to have a telescopic array with one telescope down in South America looking at midnight up the full moon and one in North Canada doing the same, if you're lucky with the weather. And the astronomer somewhere in the world, but we say for argument's sake, sitting here in the USA, and now the eyes are 6,000 miles apart, possibly some measure of the moon's geography, geographical relief might be observable, but we have Ken here who is an astrophysicist who may not be able to tell us about this. But that's about the limit. The rather end of the Earth's orbit at 180 million miles, but too much varies in what you look at. So that's all I have on the hyperscope. It starts in the first bit of disparity up to probably the wings of an aircraft. That, that's pretty much time as well. Is it? Okay. I'll leave it there in that case. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>